Hi everybody, I am Matthew Leonard and once again I am joined by my buddy Mike Aquilina, everybody's favorite fathers of the church expert. And we're, we've done this so many times now that this is almost kind of a small T tradition. We can start calling this like the Mike and Matt show or the Matt and Mike show. The M&M's. Sounds good to me. <laughs> but today we are not here to talk about the fathers of the church. We are here to talk about the mothers of the church and one mother in particular and that's St. Perpetua. And first of all, let me hold up Mike's book the Mothers of the Church, and you can read about St. Perpetua and St. Felicity, and their feast day is coming up here in just a couple of days from when we're filming. And this is available in our bookstore, at SalvationHistory.com. A couple other things that uh, Mike has been involved in. The Passion of St. Perpetua, Martyr of the Faith. And this is a documentary that was shot on location in North Africa. Take a look at this. And the story of St. Perpetua, a little children's video. Both of these are also available at the bookstore, SalvationHistory.com. So, Mike... Let's talk about St. Perpetua, one of these famous mothers of the church, or as my Austrian mother-in-law would say, a Mutter of the church. <laughs> Give us a little bit of background and some uh, history, some context for Perpetua and Felicity. Well, Perpetua was a young woman when she was condemned as a Christian. And what, what's interesting about that time, it was the reign of, of the emperor Septimius Severus. And the Severans were, were interesting because they had given up on trying to eradicate Christianity. You know, some of the emperors before them had really tried to go after the church, give it a tough persecution, try to wipe it out, try to scare the Christians away, and it didn't work. What the Severans wanted to do was just contain the problem. So what they did was they outlawed conversion to Christianity. If you were, if you were already a Christian or if you were born into a Christian family, you were kind of grandfathered in, but if you were a convert to Christianity or Judaism, you know that's that that was uh, that was an offense, and you could be you could be condemned for that. So that that was um, that that's where Perpetua found herself. She grew up in a family that was it seems was part partly Christian, some converted, but her father at least seems to have been a, a pagan. So it was divided, uh, like much of North Africa at that time. She was living in North Africa. She was a young woman. They probably had some money, the family, because here's a, a young woman who's very well educated. And not only can she read and write, but she can write like a professional. Her writing is very good. So she'd had a good education. Uh, so she grew up probably in a, in a family with, uh, with some means. So th that's the background. She was, uh, she was converting to, to Christianity. She was going to be baptized. Uh, it said she was honorably married. She was probably newly married. And she had just given birth to her first child. Um, and she was still nursing the baby um, when she was arrested and, uh, and condemned to die. There's this really interesting uh, passage that you wrote about in your Fathers of the Church book, and I'm, I'm assuming it's in the Mothers as well. But it's talking about how when she first goes into the dungeon, she's just overwhelmed by uh, just fear and kind of terror, and obviously it would be a horrible experience for anybody. And She's got this infant that she's still nursing, but over time, she has this heart change where she starts to prefer the dungeon to any other place, she said. What's going on here? We see the action of grace in someone's life here uh, because she does gradually get this sense of confidence, this sense of serenity over the course of, of, the, of the diary. And, uh, and, and she, becomes, she becomes so sure of herself, really, because of God's help, that, uh, that she becomes a leader, really, of the Christians who are in the prison. Now, they did have some improvements as well, because, because some of the Christians who were on the outside bribed the jailer to get them a little bit better situation inside. And, um, and her, her baby was taken away from her and given to her family at a certain point. So she, she no longer had uh, the anxiety about the condition of her child, uh, she was miraculously uh, kind of cured of all of the symptoms that could have uh, caused her distress during weaning, and, uh, and she, just, she just moved on. The other thing, though, is that she was given a couple of extraordinary graces, visions, heavenly visions from God about what was to come, not only in the days ahead leading up to her execution, but also in the afterlife when she reached the other side. Yeah, there's this interesting conversation that she has with her brother, and he says, hey, look, you know, you're in prison here and you're suffering. Why don't you just go ask God whether or not you're going to be saved and you're going to make it out of here? So what, what was interesting to me when I, I saw that was 
well, obviously she's holy, and her brother knows she's holy, because he's just saying, why don't you just go ask God? Yeah. And they're expecting some kind of a response, and she gets one. So and tell she, us about this vision. That's right. So she has a vision of heaven, you know, and she, it, it, it's interesting. She has several visions in the, the course of, of, of her, um, her, her stay in prison. Uh, and uh, she, does have, she does have this vision. She has a, uh, a vision that she goes to, she goes there, and it's a walled place, and it's guarded by angels, and inside, there's a congregation that would have been a lot like the liturgical assembly of the church in Carthage. And she hears them saying the things that they would have said at the Mass in Carthage. She hears them singing the Holy, 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 for example, and, wow. uh, and the Great Amen. All of these things that she would have been, she would have known from the liturgy back home. Uh, I say back home, the liturgy on earth, really. But it really is the heavenly liturgy, liturgy she's, she's witnessing and she's witnessing it in, in, um, in the same way that St. John had his apocalypse in the book of Revelation. It's an unveiling of heaven for her. She has uh, an encounter with a good shepherd in heaven. And the good shepherd gives her a cup with... Uh, the good shepherd is milking a ewe. And the good shepherd gives her a cup of milk. And she tastes the cup of milk. And she, as she does that, she hears the congregation around her say, Amen. And she said that um, it tasted sweet to her. And when she came to, when she came to her senses, when she returned to earth, so to speak, she still had the taste of sweetness in her mouth. Now, what's interesting, and what she doesn't explain, is that when someone in Carthage, North Africa, in that, that beginning of the second century, when, when a new Christian received her first communion, she would be given a chalice with milk and honey afterwards because she had entered the promised land. She had entered heaven while still living on earth. And then she would drink from this chalice of milk and honey. So there she was. She had her encounter with the good shepherd in heaven. She was given the cup, and she tasted it, and it was sweet. Now, everyone who lived, uh, every Christian living in North Africa at that time would have known what just happened. So there are all these little hints of the, the liturgy there, but she sees it in heaven. So it's a, it's, it's a continuation of what we find in the book of Revelation. It's a continuation of what we find in the book of the prophet Isaiah. There's this heavenly liturgy, and we're joined to that liturgy and, here on earth. And what's interesting, you say that there's a parallel here with John's apocalyptic vision in Revelation, and when she gets to uh, the ladder that she has that takes her up to see yes. the good shepherd, she steps on the head of a dragon. Yes, she does. That occurs to me. And you have the dragon in Revelation 12, of course, in John's vision too, and it's representing Satan. So some more parallels there. Absolutely, she does. She steps on the head of the dragon, and throughout the, uh, throughout the, the, the uh, spiritual warfare is a running theme in the Passion of Perpetua, in, the, in her diary, her prison diary. We have that, that encounter where in order to get to heaven, she has to crush the, the head of the dragon, right. and she does so right. effortlessly. It's just a matter of doing it. The, the dragon looks scary. She just has to take the initiative God takes care of the rest. She's a powerful woman because she's been baptized. So her brother says, go talk to God and let's see if you're going to make it out of here. And she discovers that she's not going to from this vision. And so she's preparing herself to endure this horrific suffering that she goes through. But what about the rest of her family? So she has this moment with her father where her father is trying to get her to recant. And she has kind of a, it's almost like a Popeye moment, I call it. I am what I am and that's yes. what I am. Yes. Tell us about that. Well, the, the encounters with her father are are so moving. They're they're real. They they're really heartbreaking, because here's a man who does not understand what his daughter is doing. And if you've ever had to to plead with a young person, you know, and and just not connect, you can you can feel it. You know, you feel the sympathy. Welcome to parenthood. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, but he's doing this and he's not getting it. You know, and she does have a lot of a lot of sympathy for him. Uh, in the beginning, he's pleading with her, please don't do this. Don't do this to me. He's, he's really invoking their love, you know, father-daughter love. Uh, that doesn't work. So then he goes after her angrily, and uh, he's, he's furious, and that doesn't work either. And the last time we see him in her diary, he goes to her trial, and he makes a scene. He's crazy. He's tearing his hair out. He's throwing himself to the floor. He's making a scene. And, uh, and the judge actually has him beaten with rods because the man is, is, uh, is causing a commotion in his courtroom. 
the man is just driven wild with grief. We don't see him again after that. And it's, it's just a sad situation because he doesn't get it. We hope that he has his conversion later on because of the, uh, the courage of his daughter. But the last time we see him, he's, he's nearly driven mad. What this shows us is the shifting idea of family at that time. Mm -hmm. In the pagan family, you know, there was this, this bond between a father and a child, and, um, and the father had a, a tremendous degree of control over the child's movements, and obedience was expected, especially from, from a female offspring, especially from a daughter. A daughter was expected to do what her father told her to do. Uh, if, if she had been a, just a couple of years younger, uh, he would have had the authority to sentence her to death himself. That's how absolute the authority of the father was over his, his, uh, his young children. So she was an adult. She was already married, and she was already a mother. Uh, and, uh, and we find that, that her family, her sense of family had shifted from her birth family to the church. Now she, she's baptized, she's reborn into a new family, and she's imprisoned with these brothers and sisters, and God is her father. And, uh, and, and she's going to go to the end with this new family of hers. It really takes a priority over her birth family, even. Yeah, because there's a deeper reality here yes. that when we're incorporated into this mystical body of Christ through the sacraments, you are my brother, mm -hmm. like it or not, and you are our brothers and sisters, like it or not. I mean, look at us. So this is a reality she experienced, and she went to her death knowing that she was part of this family in a way that superseded even her blood relations. Absolutely. Even though those, those can't be replaced yes. in a way. Well, that's fantastic stuff. Uh, it is, and there's so much more. I mean, we barely skimmed the surface of, of her, her diary. Another reason it's important, though, is that it is one of the earliest first-person accounts that we have from a woman. So this, is, this not only shows us what life was like for a woman in antiquity, seen from the outside, described by a male, we have a few of those, but this is a woman's account of her own life, of her own experiences, of birth, pregnancy, breastfeeding, weaning, all of these things that only a woman can experience. And this is a first-person account. I think it would have been almost impossible to produce such a document in the pagan world. It took Christianity to make this possible, and really, Christianity produced a masterpiece here through this great saint, Perpetua. Flesh that out just a little bit more, Mike, because really, the Christian faith gave room for women to flower in Absolutely. a way that was not available otherwise. And, and sometimes critics will point fingers at, at the church and say, we've held women down and things of that nature. And that's just kind of poppycock. It is. It is. There was no such thing as women's rights in the world before Christianity. It's only with Christianity that you have St. Paul saying this radical idea that in Christ there is neither woman nor man, that there's this radical equality. Now, it's not a sameness. We have, we have differences, our sexual differences. We have differences down to our very souls. But they're beautiful differences, and they don't render us unequal. We have different gifts. And we see that here. Perpetua is talking about things that are particularly womanly, particularly feminine. She's writing in a way that, women, that resonates with women even today, talking about some similar concerns, some common concerns. Again, we do not have documents like this from the pagan world because they were not produced, because they were not valued, because women were not given the same opportunities. Um, women could not even testify in a court of law because they were considered unreliable. Hmm. They, were, they were treated like children. They were like permanent children. But a male child would at least grow up to be a man, and then his word would be worth something in the world. Then his testimony would be valuable in a court of law. Women in the pagan world were never given those rights or those privileges. So Perpetua is truly one of our mothers in the faith, and she's an example that not just women in the church, but men too can aspire to emulate. Absolutely. Mike, thank you so much. Thank you, Matthew. Great stuff. Uh, don't forget that you can uh, like us on Facebook and take a look at SalvationHistory.com where we have a plethora of resources for you to grow in your relationship with our Lord. God Don't you love it when he uses big words like plethora? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I got my dictionary right down here. God bless you guys.